like banks who, who you put your savings in, you get a loan for a car or a home mortgage. Those are commercial banks. And they used to be local banks. They're not like that anymore. Separate. Investment banks were the banks that dealt with speculation. These are the Wall Street banks. And they're the ones who gave money for people to invest in the stock market. They would actually help corporations create. They would, they would in fact, set up the initial um, selling of stocks and bonds for companies. So investment banks are the ones involved in speculation and finance. And what was happening before the Great Depression and now is that banks were taking deposits in and telling people, your deposits are safe, and then gambling it on risky investments with their investment bank section in, in the stock market or in speculation. So they said, we just separate them. So that can no longer happen. So that combined with regulations would stabilize the banking market, but no more than FDIC. The FDIC was the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC. I was going to put the one that didn't work in the old case and send it to somebody who printed a card for garage. But that would be just. Slow it on eBay. That's fraud. No, I'm not going to do that. But I'm going to give it to somebody here. Hmm. That one great thing was a scam. Yeah. Oh, so, with that, FDIC, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, would put an insurance on deposits. It would be an insurance on deposits. And what it meant is that most people's savings, when they go in, they would not lose the whole thing, their whole savings, if the bank went under. Remember that picture we saw the video with the guys out there in front and he tells, he tell, he, he's telling the depositors the bank's out of money. We saw that yesterday. Here, this makes sure that virtually all savings will be protected. And banks have to pay an insurance premium to get in and agree to be regulated by the FDIC, but then their deposits are protected. If you go to virtually any bank or see an advertisement for a bank, it will say somewhere FDIC. Walk into the front door of a bank, it'll say FDIC. And that's to tell depositors your money is safe. Glass-Steagall would have long-term impact. It would go on for the entire, or go off, um, be important, in fact, I put it down right up here. It would provide financial stability from when it was passed, the end of 33, all the way through 2000. Provided financial stability for the United States. In fact, the United States went from being one of the financially most unstable countries to one of the most stable countries. Got to be clear, banking was profitable, pretty boring. And this kept made sure there were no bubbles, no big bubbles that did not did, uh, burst into a financial panic. In fact, there was no financial panic in those 67 years. So think about when the development of capitalism. There have been panics in 1819, and they seem to be about every 15 to 20 years, sometimes even faster. A panic, a panic, a panic. Small one, big one, none for 67 years. So the Glass-Steagall Act had a great amount of success, but you can imagine how banks chafed against this. The big bankers wanted to get bigger banks, and then they wanted a bubble. Bubbles allow for massive fortunes. Not just to be rich, they wanted the huge fortune. And also to play the game. So they had been lobbying to get rid of Glass-Steagall for as long as there had been Glass-Steagall. And there were a couple little glitches in it in the 1980s. But then you have to remember something about the 1990s. Uh, we also, I, I talked a lot about conservative economics. We'll do more liberal economics tomorrow. But mention the two. Republicans were very conservative. And the Democrats were pretty conservative in the 1990s and the 2000s. And... Um, President Clinton pushed and Congress passed a repeal of Glass-Steagall. So they repealed it in 2000. They kept the FDIC, but got rid of this and some of the other regulations. And they opened up some loopholes to regulation and said they didn't need as much reserves, a few things like that. But they got rid of it. You know, President Clinton was, was economically pretty conservative. And so this was passed. And the whole idea was that banks could now get bigger and they would allow best bank and commercial banks to unify. And this will allow for greater fortunes to be created that can be turned into more investment and production. 
And I got to say, it only took him eight years to destroy the economy. And I would have thought 15, don't you think? I mean, it would take him 15, but eight years. I mean, that's, that's the kind of gumption I respect. You know, eight years, he had a financial, a, a, a massive bubble and the bank. And that's what you lived through. And so that's how long it took. I thought maybe glass Eagle would come back, but um, conservatives were still opposed to bring it back, so that never happened. But FDIC remained. And you could argue that FDIC saved the entire financial system of the country. Because if there would not have been an FDIC, there would have been a run out of banks. And the banking system would have collapsed. And part of the reason it would have been so bad is that there are significantly fewer banks today than there were in 1930, let's say. And so in 1930, when a lot of banks shut down, there were small individual banks that were really hard and people lost their money, but, but there's still a lot of other banks. By 2008, there were only a few banks. Now, if there would have been a run on them, that would have been all the banks. Now there's even fewer. And so that's why FDIC was a big deal. They tried to get rid of it, but banks, then banks said, no way, wait, wait, we need that. Very important law. And right now there's some talk about bringing Glass-Steagall back. We'll see. Another big law we have to get to would be the Security and Exchange Act, which created the Securities and Exchange Commission. Securities and Exchange Commission. This regulated the stock market. Securities are stocks and bonds. So this regulated the stock market. And one of the big things is it required transparency. It said that companies had to tell their revenue. They had to tell, had to be honest about their, their profits. And that's why, if you ever notice any, you ever notice they have something called quarterly, quarterly reports by companies trading on the stock market, that's why the SEC requires it. And if they do lie or they do um, send what's called insider trading and give special information to friends so they get a, are allowed to either make money on stock or to sell it until shorting before it goes down, that's illegal. And so the SEC can regulate the stock market and control some of the, um, some of the financial instruments that it can use. But a lot of these were deregulated in the 1990s also under President Clinton. And a little bit of Reagan, but especially with President Clinton, and remember the ICC, remember the Interstate Commerce Commission regulated railroads and talked about how they might put railroad men on the commission. So if there's a president that doesn't not doesn't want the stock market to be regulated, they could put someone who's like from an investment bank or what's called a hedge fund, which speculates in the stock market, in charge of it. And the odds are they're probably not going to regulate it. That'll be the fox guarding the hen house. The reason I say hedge fund, it's the former head of the hedge fund is the head of the SEC now. So that's implying probably not really enforcing the regulation. So like all regulated for our bodies, they have issues. There are other things with this. Um, one body, I, I'm not going to make it right down, but have you ever heard of the FCC? The Federal Communications Commission? That's a new deal. First new deal before. And the whole idea was to regulate the airwaves. The public owns the airwaves, so they'll regulate TV and radio, and that went into cable television. And technically, the internet, but they've given up regulating the internet in the last year. And that might be a really big deal down the road. They are going to take over the internet. Already are taking over, they'll completely taking over very soon. And so we'll see where that's going to go. But that, the FCC. But let me tell you two more things it did. Another big thing of the first New Deal was aggressively, aggressively using, remember the Sherman Anti-Trade? I'm sorry, the Sherman Anti-Trust Act? So the first president since Wilson, or sorry, Wilson a little bit, but thank you for saying yes, Nick. Wilson, the Sherman Anti-Trust Act, start breaking up monopolies. And... Hopefully you remember the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, that was signed during the Wilson administration. They began to aggressively look for actions that big companies would use to control the market, called restraint of trade. And they aggressively tried to bring competition to capitalism up until 
The cutoff data is always given in 1980. You can see this start to end at the end of the Carter administration in the late 70s, but especially with President Reagan, where today they simply do not, they do nothing about the monuments. So that was about 40 years of really aggressively trying to break up monopolies and bring competition. And so that's been a big shift, but that was his policy. By the way, monopolies, remember this, you get a lot more money if you have a monopoly, so that was it. You can see the impact of monopolies all over. Just go to a little town. All the little stores are gone. And look at here. Almost no little stores anymore. They're all big. That's monopolies. So and that's one big one. The whole idea was more competition. That raises wages. And something else. Oh, kind of a biggie. They got off the gold standard. This might be the single biggest thing that turned the economy around, going off the gold standard. I told you about how Hoover tried to coerce Roosevelt into doing what Hoover wanted right before Roosevelt was inaugurated. This was the biggie. Hoover wanted Roosevelt to, to pledge to stay on the gold standard. And Roosevelt would not do it. And in May of 1933, the United States went off the gold standard. So dollars would not be directly um, exchanged for gold anymore. And this was huge. Because the gold standard, I'm not going to go into all the complexities of how the gold standard works. The U.S. has been on it since 1873. But being on the gold standard deflates the currency. Remember, there's already deflation because of overproduction. Remember, debt deflation. And now the economic system is pressing down on deflation, meaning money's overvalued and virtually none's in circulation. By going off the gold standard, that allowed the United States to inflate its currency, meaning drop it in value. So that gave the United States the ability to put more money in circulation and hopefully raise prices, raise wages, get money out there. And this is a big deal. Countries that are on something that operates like a gold standard can't inflate. And if they can't inflate, that means they got to figure out ways to, well, they got to buy more, in this case, gold. And that means they got to take money out of the economy to buy gold. The euro does that. Countries that got on the euro, when they went into the crash, a lot of them, they couldn't inflate. And so they just went into an economic catastrophe because they weren't on their own currency. Greece, Italy, Italy's still in it. Greece is still in it. Spain hasn't really recovered. Portugal. Germany did okay, but a lot of other ones did. Big deal, but inflate your currency. The U.S. would get back on somewhat of a gold standard, but not completely right after the war, called Bretton Woods. And then in 1971, the U.S. went off the gold standard. And that's where it is today. And it's actually a pretty remarkable thing now that the United States is off the gold standard. You think about it for a second. The U.S. creates money from what? Money and people want it, right? All of you want money, right? And so all we gotta do is to say we create it and people care. It's valuable. Do you think anything else is created out of thin air that people want? Boy, does that give the country a lot of power. What's that? So that's a big deal. We'll talk about this. It, it, it changes everything when you create your own currency. It, it's really a big deal. Um, debts are not as important to federal governments because of that. So what this did, though, this first New Deal, this did change a lot of things. It did bring about recovery, but it wasn't big enough in a lot of ways, and it got a lot of enemies. So let's very quickly get down the enemies. It's amazing how polarizing Roosevelt was. You're not going to find a president who was more popular than Franklin Roosevelt amongst the vast majority and hated as much as he was by a minority of the population. So we're going to go by direction here. Let's go your side. So we'll have left over here, enemies on the left, and enemies on the right. Right or left, economically, which one is more conservative? Which is conservative? 
Right. That's conservative. This is more liberal. And the very wealthy hated Roosevelt. I can't even begin to describe to you their hatred. They called him a traitor to his class. They thought that he was destroying the country. He has taken away their wealth. He has taken away what built America. And they despised him for it. The wealthy and most of them were very conservative economically, considered him to be a what? Not just a traitor to his class, but what economic philosophy? They, and they would have said a communist, but you're exactly right for all of them. He's a commie. He's a red. By the way, what do you call communist is red? What do you call it? He's only slightly communist. A pink. So, he's a commie. Remember the bomb throwing anarchist thing? He's just kind of a, he's destroying the, he's destroying the country. And they thought if we let him go, he will eventually either destroy the country and lead it to ruin or turn us into Joseph Stalin's favorite country. He'll come over and take over. Stalin then by then was a dictator of the totalitarian state of the Soviet Union. And so, Many of the wealthiest people in the United States at the end of the summer of 1933 had seen all these new New Deal programs, which really a lot of them weren't all that big. They began to organize a coup. Sometimes it's called the millionaire's coup or the conservative coup. What's a coup? Overthrow the government. Yeah, they're going to overthrow the government. Their plan was to overthrow the government. Part of the thing was they got to get rid of these, this crazy republic. And that constitution is allowing for dangerous leaders like Roosevelt in there. So they want to get rid of that. They want an authoritarian government, an authoritarian government that will protect, as they see it, the country's prosperity, which of course coincides directly with their wealth. And therefore, what type of government do they want? A government that the, the name was literally just created a decade earlier, fascism. An authoritarian government that would protect their financial wealth. And this, you read the writings at the time, they said this all the time. Fascism will protect our wealth. They, they were very clear about it. And so who do they want to be their leader? Who is their idol? Castro was Cuban. And, not, and uh, a little kid. He was a little kid. He would write a letter to Roosevelt this time, though. No. Who is it again? Mussolini. Benito Mussolini. Mussolini took power with the help of the very big businesses in Italy. He assured their wealth, got rid of labor unions, so wages fell. Mussolini made sure that the fortunes remained on top. Got really good lucrative contracts. That's who they wanted. Protected finance. They didn't like the military stuff because you don't know where military is going to go. And he was anti-communist. And that's what got Mussolini in power. He wasn't a communist. That's what got Hitler in the power. Anti-communism. And Hitler was a little bit too crude to their point of view. Mussolini, they liked a little bit better. And so you had members of, anybody know what the DuPont family, they're, how they got rich? Chemicals paint, the chemicals. Uh, some of the Rockefellers, a couple of the Rockefeller grandchildren, grandchild of uh, J.P. Morgan, a um, another family's name I can't remember. Oh, a couple of the Vanderbilts. They were all involved in raising money to organize a coup. And they took Mussolini as their guy. Mussolini took power by getting some of the wealthiest people in Italy to help fund an army of veterans of World War I. Got them all nice black uniforms, and they're called the black shirts, and they marched on Rome and intimidated the government to give Mussolini all the power. Actually, Mussolini was kind of shocked by it, but he took it. Wait, an army of World War I veterans, haven't we had this before? What was it called? It's a bonus army. Get like the bonus army, but this time pay them, get them uniforms, and control them. March on Washington, D.C., and coerce the government to give power. In fact, create a new cabinet level position. 
who had become like a dictator. They were going to call it the uh, Secretary of the Homeland. And in fact, that's why when they created the Homeland, Homeland Security in 2002, the Department of Homeland Security, it bothered me. Because I remember this. There's a couple of other Homeland things to tie in there. Anybody know what they, who they asked to lead it? So you knew it couldn't be one of them. It had to be somebody who seemed outside of it. Smedley Butler. Remember that general I told you about the you know, we saw the end of that film on the bonus army? Smedley Butler. And they knew Butler had wrote a best-selling book about how he was being used by the banks during big stick diplomacy. So they and they thought Butler's against this. They thought, no way. We can buy off anybody. We just give them money. So they brought Butler in. Smedley Butler came in and they pitched the deal to him. Pitched it to him. Butler listened and said, I'll get back to you. Walked out. You know what he did? And he immediately got a meeting with Frank Roosevelt. Butler was furious. He hated those people and their traitors. He hated them. And he was not going to be bought off. He was not that type of person. It's kind of scary to what if they would have found somebody who was that popular who would be willing to be bought off? Trust me, there's a lot of people who can be bought off really easily. I'm not looking at anyone in here, but but the thing is, but he didn't. Now Roosevelt actually wanted them arrested for treason. They all fled the country, by the way. Gone. They all left. They wouldn't come back for two years or so. But Roosevelt was talked out of it because they convinced him. People found out that some of the richest people in America tried to overthrow the government. That might lead to communism. The communists might use that as an excuse to revolt. I don't know if that would have happened, but that's what Roosevelt's convinced. So basically, they came right out, no, you did it, don't do it again. That was a smart move. They should have been held accountable. They committed treason and put away. Far too many times, up to about like right now, people who committed horrible crimes are let off. And what does that encourage? Yeah. The term is called moral hazard. And if you allow somebody to do something, they keep, they'll keep doing it. That's why I'm looking at all of you. But no, it's, a, it's an issue. It really is. And so that's what I think. But then again, I was not president of the United States in 1933. I think I've been president for a really long time. And so I didn't. No, imagine me in that pressure filled situation. I don't, I have sympathy. But one more person we have to get to on the right, and his name is Father Coughlin. He was the radio priest, the radio priest. And he took advantage of this amazing new media of radio. This amazing new media of radio to talk directly to the people. And he, not that he was a poly speaker, but he played on their fears, got him going, and he at first went against Hoover, then was for Roosevelt, and then said Roosevelt was going too far. Roosevelt was going too far, and he might lead to, at first he said communism, but more and more being communism influenced by worldwide Jewish. Remember, this was the most racist time, and by far the most anti Semitic time. Even though we're getting to a period of it's interesting how things cycle around. And he would start calling Rosen. Uh, he would start calling Roosevelt Rosenfeld. Feld is a common suffix to a, a Jewish surname. They ever called him the same thing. And the idea that he is being controlled by Jews and people believe a lot of people this Jewish conspiracy must lay in with the bankers and also communists, which makes no sense. But if you're you're making people scared, you don't need to make sense. And he soon had millions of listeners. And he packed away against Roosevelt. He'd be popular all the way up to 1941. And it showed the power of the media to play on people's fears and their um, their, their innate, maybe innate prejudices and, and also racism. It really showed this. And this happens to this very day. Play many of the same almost verbatim to what Father Coughlin said. So it's not like all of a sudden we know better. No, I mean, we're always susceptible. Every society is. On the left, communists. Communists, and we had a growing communist party during the recession. And how do you think they thought about those belts? Huh? No. 
Now, even more than that, Roosevelt was trying to do these things to save to save capitalism. So they were furious at him. A lot of communists are like, you're saving capitalism. We want capitalism to go under. So now some of the more moderate socialists just wanted Roosevelt to go a little bit further. Some of the more moderate socialists were like, yeah, we'd like you to do more, but we got to help people right now because we're suffering. A lot of the communists, blow it up, new system. It's ironic, isn't it, though? The communists hated Roosevelt because he's saving capitalism, and what did they call him? I want to tell you my Barbara Bush story. Do you hear my Barbara Bush story? So this is, do you remember the heady days? God, we were all so young then, 1991. Remember those days? Yeah, it was just, life was different then. Trying to sound music was better. And the answer is, eh. Every decade there's good and bad. And music is very personal. Who decides what's good music? <laughs> Me! I do! So, 1991, George H.W. Bush was president. I'm back to this. I was thinking about music. I don't know what made me think about music. And I was watching, have you ever heard of Barbara Walters? She used to be a, a, a very prominent journalism, journalist, but she'd also do a lot of these interviews with like famous people. Well, she was interviewing Barbara Bush who was the first lady, and George H.W. Bush in 91 was really popular. It was about ready to crash his popularity, but he was really popular at that time. And so she was pretty popular. And one of the things about first ladies, all of them are, are compared to Eleanor Roosevelt. There's, been, there's never been a first lady who's had more influence on policy, on um, the direction of government, on human rights. Actually, because of the... Um, U.S. ambassador to the United Nations after the war, after World War II. Eleanor Roosevelt was just this incredibly talented, very smart person, a lot of influence on her, on her husband, and so every first lady is compared to her. In fact, uh, we, uh, my wife and I named our first cat. After her. See? But, 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 Given this interview, and one of the things about Barbara Bush, she's from old wealth, much like Roosevelt, <laughs> old wealth. And her great, her great, great grandfather was Franklin Pierce, remember the president? And but she's like George Bush, old wealth. And they hated this traitor to the class. And so they're at, they kind of these softball questions, that's what they do. Then she asked, a lot of people have compared you to Eleanor Roosevelt. And Barbara Bush bristled immediately, angry. And offended and said, We do not mention that. And that was 1991. So that's giving the attitude of how much people hated her. And then, like, compared to the story yesterday with that guy, just the guy, a working man from New York City, who said, We loved him so much, we wanted to kiss his toenails. I just think that's so funny. The different attitudes towards him. So, communists hated him. And then, those who wanted him to go farther, one of the most important was Dr. Francis Townsend. Townsend looked at one of the biggest problems in America, Townsend. Yes, Townsend, was so Townsend was a problem. Still is. Yeah, look at Townsend. We're going to let them go. <laughs> now, I forgot. <laughs> This is, a, this is something that came with capitalism. Retirement. You know, people worked until they didn't work anymore. Until they're done. But now, with people more and more having to get a job, you work where the capital is, there's a situation where they used to always say, you're too old to work and too young to die. Then what? And most people weren't able to save any money. So either they had to live with their children and nobody wants to be a burden on their children, and especially in a time of depression, they're having trouble with their own family, then they care for their parents, or they live in absolute misery, and many of them would lose their homes and everything, and put them, they call them old age homes. And they're usually run by the states, and they're these big, basically like a jail, these big, stark buildings where they would pack in elderly people who had lost their homes. And they basically would just live in misery until they died. They give them a little bit of food and they just 
I mean, just these things, everybody was terrified of these. This wasn't a nice little retirement home. This was a, a hell hole. I guess in a way, kind of hoping they died faster. What's that? And this is everybody's fear. The poverty rate amongst retired people was 80%. So you think about that for a second. Virtually everybody's looking down the road and saying, this is going to be me. This is one of their greatest fears. So Townsend said what everybody needs is a government-funded old-age pension. Populists had wanted this. Unions had wanted this. The progressives had wanted this. This goes completely against conservative economics. Now, he wanted a pretty big one, $1,000 a month, which was then a lot of money. But Townsend clubs appeared all over, all over, pushing Roosevelt and the Democrats for an old age pension. One more on the left, I got to put up here, and it's Huey Long. Huey Long was the governor and then senator from Louisiana. He ran the state of Louisiana. And he had one of the greatest nicknames ever the Kingfish. Why did I put the king thing in here? <laughs> it was the king thing. <laughs> That's better. The kingfish. Now, he long, yeah, he did steal some money, like a political machine, a little bit of graph. But he did provide some good things for Louisiana. He did provide one of the, but not the ugliest state capital. He just had this old, really cool state capital, Baton Rouge, and he replaced it with this just granite. Tower that's just ugly. Have you been? It's ugly. It's not the ugliest state capital. Nebraska's is really bad, but South Dakota would knock your socks off. It's shocking. Sorry, South Dakota. Wow, your capital's ugly. Has anyone been to the capital of South Dakota? Beautiful pier? You'll never leave. <laughs> so, the kingfish. He came up with an idea. At first, he's pro New Deal. And then he says he's not doing enough. People need money. They need guarantees from those thieves who ran the monopolies and the financiers who broke the economy. And he started a club called They're Stealing Our Wealth. It's time we share our wealth. And share our wealth clubs begin to appear all over the country. And basically, what it was, it said, we're going to confiscate. All the big estates. So anybody who had an estate of over five million dollars, all above five million, it's confiscated by the government. And no incomes over one million. You'll be taxed at 100 percent above one million. So for example, if you make two million dollars a year, that million dollars above that would be taxed at 100 percent And then that would provide everybody with a guaranteed income. And that's what you got to get. About a thousand bucks a month. Also, everybody would get a $5,000 home estate. So everybody would be guaranteed a yearly income. The numbers aren't as important as this idea of a guarantee. Because think about people suffering the Great Depression. Even if they had a job, they're worried it might go away tomorrow. And they know if they had a guaranteed income, regardless, they will not starve, and they'll be able to care for their family until something better comes up. This was greatly appealing, and they blamed those people who want to take their money. The math didn't work 100%, but it really was popular. In fact, by 1935, he was rivaling, rivaling, I didn't talk, rivaling, I can't even say that, rival King. King Fing was right. <laughs> yeah. Is it an emergency? Go. Quick. Not here. Oh, wait, wait. Oh, I was going to why am I doing this? Oh, I forgot. Wait, can you so, he thought about running for president in 1935, or running in 36, as an independent against Roosevelt. Did everyone catch that? He thought about running for president in 36, but he would have been a third party candidate. We've talked about what third parties do in a winner take all system like the United States. If he would have jumped in in 36, who would have won the presidency? We have winner take all. So you have a Republican and you have a Democrat. The Democrat was outlanded. Yeah, 
because the vote for things like the New Deal on the left, there would have been split between Long and Roosevelt. That's why we don't have a third party. And anyone says, yeah, we should do an independent run with somebody. No, it doesn't work that way. It, it just, we're stuck in a system where we just really can't do that. And so that's why. It's one of the great what-ifs in American history. What if he would have ran? Because what happened? Yes. On the steps of his own ugly courthouse, right after it was built, he was assassinated. With something that had to do totally about Louisiana politics, nothing to do with this, but Huey Long was murdered. It's one of the great what-ifs in history. But let's look at one thing really quick. Then. How did the first New Deal do? Economically, it did. Did I turn that on? Is it flashing? It did better than anyone could have expected. Roosevelt thought if we got rid of the gold standard and a few things, the economy would boom. It really boomed. It shocked him. So let me show you a couple graphs to give you an idea how much the economy. So put down that it did work, at least for stopping the free fall. The GDP would go on the biggest six year or five year growth in its history. Never before or since. Will the economy grow faster in a continuous time than what it did after the first New Deal? The economy boomed. Well, let me rephrase that. It didn't boom, but the economy was growing. The free fall was over. Second, let's jump right to this. Incomes went up. So the amount of money in circulation went up. I'll explain this little glitch here tomorrow. And industrial production went up. You get the point here? But why is it bad? Unemployment remained high. And that's why it's called a depression. Unemployment was still well over 25% in 33. But you'll notice there's two lines. For reasons I can't really explain, it's not clear. They didn't count many government jobs as work. So they counted people who got jobs with like the CCC as unemployed stuff. And so they're working, and they have paychecks, and they're spending money, but they're counted towards this. If it's adjusted for those jobs, unemployment dropped pretty dramatically, but it's still really high. And that would lead, that's what we call depression, high unemployment, read to, write down the second New Deal. The second New Deal, our graphs on. I like graphs. Sometimes I don't know if they work, but I still just like graphs. Like I like arrows with maths. The second New Deal, you want me to keep it orange? You want a different color? Red. 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 How about purple? Red. So, the second New Deal was going to be dramatically expanded programs that have more of a direct effect on workers' lives. In fact, the Second New Deal really was, when people look back at the New Deal, it's the Second New Deal that people really know it. And we see in many elements to this very day. So let's get to the first really big program pushed by the Townsend, 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 we're not Revolutionary War, Social Security. This would provide an old age pension to everybody that works or if you had a spouse that worked and they passed away, the benefits will go to the spouse. Or if one of the two parents, or one or both of the parents passed away, or that tragedy hit, Social Security benefits will go to the children until they became adults. I know a couple of things that have happened to me. My two. My Social Security saved everything. And that's basically get the pension. So that. So it was designed not just for old age, but remember I told you how, how many fathers were abandoning their family to the Great Depression? It was designed for that. What about the people who lost them for their abandonment? What do we do about the dependent children? So old age pension. Everybody who works, there was a problem with it at first. It only applied to wage earners, and people like farm workers or sharecroppers or home ser or servants didn't get this. It was racist. It was specifically designed not to go to blacks and not to go to Hispanic workers. And Roosevelt knew this. He made a deal. To get Social Security passed, he made a deal with segregationist Southerners to get it passed, but exclude those workers that many of them were not, were not white. In the 1950s and 60s, they, they would get the benefits. 
but you know, there's like everything else, I would say there are flaws to it. But this would become by far the most popular government program in history. Poverty rate went down, went down to about 10% amongst the elderly, once retired. And it wasn't a pension as big as the Township had a pension. But Roosevelt played them off each other. What Roosevelt did is this. He went to the conservatives and said, you better not go against me too much, or we'll get something like the Township. Townston clubs and the $1,000 a month pension, three times bigger than what, I, what this is going to give them. Then he went to the Townsend supporters and said, if you go against me, they'll win and we'll get no pension, which is how you make deals. And that's how it got it to work. Now, the thing about it is all workers get it. It's not supposed to be big enough to be your only retirement, but it will be big enough to get out of pocket. The idea is to be about a savings. That makes sense. And how do they pay for it? This is what we call social insurance. So everybody pays in when they work, and then when you don't work, you collect the benefits. Anybody work where you have W-2 and they take withholding? You anybody else? A few people here, or you might have a job at some time, go back to maybe the summer. So I do. It's a payroll tax. Everybody gets a tax taken out before you ever see it. It was one and a half percent. It went to 3.25. In 1983, during the Reagan administration, it was one of the biggest tax increases in history. It went up to 6.2% that all of you pay if you work. 6.2, so I pay 6.2, and then my employer, the school district, cashes it at 6.2. And so it is a 12.4% tax on all income. But then we working today pay for the retirees. Then the retiree, or then when I retire, you better get two jobs because I'm going to live a life of luxury. No, then when you work, pay it, so on. And if you're self employed, you got to pay the full 12.4%. And yes, that's a big fight, but the pension also is a big, big deal. And you might not think about it now, but start talking to people near retirement or retired, and they will tell you what a big deal that is. And everybody gets it. Some people try to convince Roosevelt to support something that only, or that the very wealthy won't get it. And he brought up two really good points. First off, it would probably cost more money just to weed out the people who shouldn't get it. And secondly, if everyone gets it, they can never get rid of it. So I have just a little bit more to cover it. Then we got to do taxes, the WPA, and change of economics call. Isn't that exciting? Yay! What? And most working people have their taxes go up this year, so that's fine. Mine did. Yeah, that's Montana. I can't. I can't imagine you paid federal income tax, but I only paid like forty bucks in taxes, but, <laughs> but you had to pay social security. Yeah. And that's your biggest tax. Like Okay. Okay. And go through that list. 
So I have to run up to the library. Yeah. Like, the yeah. Go. Um, but really, so should I take the test? Really? <laughs> yeah. So should I do it? No, I'm going to be here all week. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody, you need paper. You need paper, you need pencils, you need pens, you need. Lead? Yeah. All right, get out your lead, too. I have a few musket balls in the Civil War. I can call it. And then tomorrow, Treasure of Sierra Mon. Don't plan nine. And it, it is one of it, it is I guarantee you know And the odds are normal. Oh, and then and then Alice informed me he is bringing lead for everyone to have on Friday as a treat during it. Yeah, give him something. Give him something, people. Left. Makers can't be choosers. All right, here we go. Any questions on the test? Yeah. Where are the answers? All the answers are G. It's like a broken clock. You're going to be right on these ones. Yeah. Huh? Yeah, but no answers. Just, just use it to scratch paper. Anything else? Oh my God! What are you doing? Yes, you can write, write your, write your matching answer here, but on a separate sheet, you show the show IDs because I like line paper. All right, here we go. Oh, I tried. I tried to get one or two questions from every, everyone. There are a few short IDs. I do have the characteristics of cult, and also you'll see forty-six through forty-eight. Forty-six through forty-eight. You'll see. Oh, that's coming. I want to save it. I want to save it for but it just hit it really hard. All right, here we go. You have three minutes, and then we begin the pizza strip. <laughs> oh, yeah, you've been gone for like a month. No. Forty-five or forty-six and forty-eight. You gotta write the answer now. Forty-six, forty-eight. You got to write it down. Is there enough room to write down there? Or you want to do it in a separate sheet? Yeah. Either one. 
I'm going to go pretty easy. I'm going to go a little bit wide reading. 